not interested in any of that, dude. He says, it's a, it's a lease. And I'm way overdue for the oil change while I'm here getting the snow tires put on. Do my oil change. That was it. He didn't care. The MPI does take time, especially now with the way they want them done where, I mean, let's be real, for 20 years, I just did it with a check mark on a sheet and I handed it in and I didn't, I didn't take pictures and, and film videos and all that kind of stuff. Now, that process is much longer. Are we, should we still be doing an MPI for a customer that's declining work every time we're trying to sell it? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another exciting, thought-provoking episode of the Jaded Mechanic Podcast. My name is Jeff, and I'd like to thank you for joining me on this journey of reflection and insight into the toils and triumphs of a career in automotive repair. After more than 20 years of skin knuckles and tool debt, I want to share my perspectives and hear other people's thoughts about our industry. So pour yourself a strong coffee or grab a cold Canadian beer and get ready for some great conversation. Yeah, that scenario you talked about, that's not really mentorship, right? Like I yeah. I talk all the time, there's there's dealers around here that have a couple really old pieces of wood and they always put the, they put the new hire with that person and then that new hire always doesn't seem to last and they always wonder why that is and it's like, well, because what that new hire got really good at was taking the wheels off and then waiting until he got told what to do. You know, he didn't he didn't test drive the car. He didn't, uh, you know, hook the scan tool up. He just kind of <clears throat> did the lifting, did the dirty work, and then kind of maybe watched, but I've never seen them actually bring them in and show them, coach them through like, okay, this is where I found this, or this is the, the PIDs you want to look at on your data screen. Like, you know, I, I, I never saw that happening. Whereas I'm very much like, if I find a really cool fix, if I find a really neat diag and I get to the root of it, I'm going to call it, I'm going to show everybody in the damn shop because a I'm like, I'm bragging about it, but B I'm also showing you that it's like, Hey, we work on a lot of these. If I'm not here one day and one comes in and it's doing this, remember this, right? Uh, I don't want, like when I started out, it was a lot of, I mean, I learned a lot working under one guy, but it was a lot of like, we did a lot of safeties. So it was like, he would road test the car. He'd bring it in, put it in the, in the rack. And then he'd say, okay, pull all the wheels off. And that's what I did. And then I waited and then he would go around and he would look at this and he would look at that and he would shake this and shake that. And he'd be like, okay, put the wheels back on. I had no concept of what the process was other than really taking the wheels off. I didn't understand everything that was going on. I mean, yes, I watched him do something, but I didn't understand the, you know, what is, what is allowable? What's not allowable? What, why would you sell brakes at this point versus not? Nobody was instructing me with that. You know, it was just it was another safety inspection. So people that are listening, if you're hiring young people, don't make them, don't hire them just to get the heavy lifting done. You know, it, it comes with a mentorship role is that we have to be showing them why. The why is so important, right? Like, you know, yeah. I wish somebody at, at early in my career, because a lot of it was just me staring at a scan tool myself and figured out, I wish somebody had spent more time showing me how to graph certain PIDs what it actually is supposed to look like, what it, and, and, and work up from that. You know, so much of it was me by accident and me and my own time just trying to figure it out, you know. But like, do you find the mentorship we talk in the, in the groups and it's a buzz topic? Do you feel like we're with this technician shortage? Are we, are we failing at it or are we just doing okay? I, I think it's a massive fail. Mm-hmm. This shop here, uh, at one time, we tried hiring a bunch of C techs and stuff, try to train them up. But you know, when you get busy, you know, hey, we got to bang out hours. And you know, now I went from like the 60, 75 hour a week guy to 45, 50 because I'm trying to show these guys. And mm-hmm. you know, they're still only turning 20, 22 hours. And we're, we're not a training shop. And I am not afraid to admit that. Uh, it's hard to, to train guys up. We do have one guy here that we, we are training up, uh, we're sending four people to vision. So oh, right I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to get one of my techs. He's a B tech. He wants to be more, but doesn't really want to be more. So I'm trying to get him to that next level. Uh, but there again, I think it's okay if somebody stays a B tech all their life, if that's what they're good at 
And a good B tech is going to make just as much money as an A tech. And there's a lot of A techs that will say they can make more because, you know, they're not getting proper diagnosis charged and everything else. Where a B tech, man, they can hang and bang. I would take a $10 an hour cut and never do a check into light again in my life. And I would make so much freaking money. Yeah. Like I, I'm an 80, 100 hour a week guy. If you give me nothing but steering, suspension, you know, brakes, like I, I will kill it. Yeah. But, you know, I, there again, not every shop needs that guy. No. It's easy it, to hire Uncle Bob for that. Yeah. No, when you say your young person um, wants to go to A but doesn't really want to, can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by that? He wants to get to the next level, but, you know, there's buying a scan tool or getting the training to do it because cars are a lot harder than it was when I started. So for me to try to teach somebody, it's even harder. Yeah. Uh, and it comes down to like, are you a lab scope shop or are you a, a scanner shop? Most of my diags revolve around scan data. So you can learn a lot from a scan tool. If you know, if you're graphing the right things and you know, you're looking at fuel trims, you know, you can get a lot from a scan tool and a dollar bill on the exhaust pipe and a yeah. vacuum gauge that yes. you don't have to get a lab scope out for yeah. that. It's hard to teach that to somebody. It really is. Really is. You know, the cars changed uh, just that was the Atkinson cycle. Mm-hmm. Like first time I hooked up my vacuum gauge to one of them, I'm like, oh crap, this thing jumped time. This vacuum is low. I mean, we're like, you know, we're like 13 inches of vacuum. I'm like, no, that's normal. I'm like, no, 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 that ain't right. This thing's, it's got to jump time, but it's got a lot of power. I don't understand. So yeah. yep. to try to teach somebody, there's two different ones. And then turbos are throwing a whole new mix into it. It makes it that much harder. So for me to teach him, it's hard to get him to grasp some of these things and to get the proper tools out. Uh, I'm a, I'll admit I'm a coil changing misfire guy. Like I, it's easy. It's right there. Coil goes here. Spark plug goes here. Fire it up. Where did it go? Follow that. Yep. It's coil plug stays on the same one. Cool. Now we're getting, you know, we're doing the dollar bill. We're doing a vacuum test. We're doing the rest of it. So Brian, Brian Pollock and I talk all the time about that. Like, I mean, we all, uh, I'm relatively new to a lab scope. You know, like I said, I, I bought the Zeus. And, you know, I just finished my course that I talked about where, you know, we went on that five, five days of in-depth, really serious people. And I loved it. But I mean, like, I'm still, I don't pull that sucker out for, for that test for, for a misfire, unless I, you know, I've already, uh, you know, unless I already know that I'm it's faster to do it that way because the coils are buried. If, it, if I'm working on a four cylinder and the coils are right there, it, to me, you're just over complicating the process. You know, yeah. you really are. You trust your scan tool and I get it. I understand where it comes from. And, um, but man, like I, I, I wanted to learn it for a relative compression test. And, but I still say all the time, like if, you know, guys need to learn a relative compression test, just audibly, just audibly, yeah. it, you know, and, and a VE, you know, a VE test and a, and a relative compression, you're 90% there on so many problems on a car that don't, you know, like the lab scope's a great tool, but it's like when guys yank it out for a parasitic draw, I just kind of shake my head and go like. See, I, when, I, when I started out, uh, I got big into lab scopes, you know, Fulton and all them guys, ignition scopes, you know, because we had the big box in the corner and you always hooked it up to all the plug wires. So I was good at looking at raster patterns and all that stuff. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I got COVID real bad and I lost so much Diag stuff in my head. Uh, really? I just bought, I bought a new Vantage Pro because I needed that little extra help because I forgot so much. And for me, it's, I was really struggling with diag stuff. I went from like the head diag guy to like, oh, it's got a misfire. I'm kind of struggling a little bit. So I, I almost have to relearn some things. Like, yeah. So I lost a lot of my memory and I hate to say it this way, but the manager position, I think is actually an easier position than being the head tech. So oh, I- I, I'm, 
guess what? I'm a pencil pusher now because I, I'm kind of struggling learning all the ignition patterns and I, I feel stupider than I was. So it's easier to be manager. Well, you know, I don't want to, like you say, it's easier, but I, I think sometimes it is easier to be the manager than it is to be the, the go-to tech in the shop because the go-to tech in the shop, I want to argue that sometimes there's as much responsibility put on that person as there is on the manager. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, I, really is. I felt more. Yeah. Because it's like, if you don't know and you're the go-to guy, then the shop doesn't know. And then immediately the, you know, the buck stops there. Well, how do you proceed from that? How do you fix that car? You know, like you don't know what's wrong with it. You've done your testing or whatever. And it immediately comes on to what's, why don't you know? Right. Whereas it's like, if it's the manager, the manager's just always, not always, but is, is it's a cause and effect thing. He's waiting for the effect of, of the diag to know how to proceed. When we don't get a diag, how do we proceed? You know, so. Yeah. Oh, crap. Yeah. Oh, crap is right. Eh? It's like when you, going back to the mentorship thing and you're talking about vision and stuff like that, do you think your young person when he goes to vision is going to come away from vision, maybe understanding and seeing a little bit now how he gets to, to the A level? I'm, I'm hoping it gives him that next drive. I love vision. I love the classes. I love the camaraderie because I, I had only went for the first time two years ago. Like I didn't even know it existed. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been in this industry this long. I never even knew that existed. Yeah. So when I got to go, uh, you know, I was all because of the, the actually Lucas and David talked about it in one of their Facebook posts. So it's like, oh, I'm going to check that out. And then somebody said, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good thing. So they, they're the ones that got me, Bump. So I'm hoping that he goes here, he sees all these other people like him, mm -hmm. and hopefully he comes back and like he's ready to, to learn a little something new. I brought my scan tool in. I got my my lab scope. I have all this stuff here behind me just for the guys like, hey, if you want to learn that stuff, let me let me teach you. You can use all my tools. Yeah. I got $160,000 worth of tools sitting here and toolbox is wide open use what you need. Let's learn it. So I'm hoping that it's going to get him asking the questions like, okay, now I got a check engine light and it's a elite, uh, 171 code. Like he kind of struggled with that. He, could do, he was good at misfires because I kind of taught him the whole thing yeah. swap a coil, yeah. but you know, you get a lean code. Some people are freaking out like, Oh, what do I do? Like, where do I go? Well, is it at idle? Is it off idle? That kind of gives you a thing. A VE test going to let you know, you know, we got a mass airflow problem, you know. So I'm hoping he's going to come back pumped up a little bit. Because nobody's that's... ever done anything like this for him. He's never, nobody's ever took the time to invest in him. Mm -hmm. And I've been investing heavily in this kid. I want him, he's not a kid. He's early 30, late 20s, early 30s. So, yeah. but yeah. to me, <laughs> he's still a kid. Yeah. So, you know, I, I want him, I want him to know that people care and we want him to get to the next level. I want everybody to get to the next level. Yeah. Including I think, shops. I think that's pretty awesome. I, I talk all the time about ASTE, you know, I haven't been to vision yet. I'm hoping to go next year. A couple of people are, you know, it's visions coming up and people are like, are you going, are you going and you're going? I'm like, not this year. The The goal is to try and be able to travel a lot more next year. If I could, I'd like to hit ultimately like AST, Apex, and Vision all in 2024. But, yeah. uh, or, you know, like starting in the the fall of 2024 and work over into 2025. Because, you know, Vision, everything, everybody talks about it. Like when you're at AST and you're walking around, everybody's like, are you going to be at Vision? I'm like, mm, I don't think so. And they're like, if you think this is something, AST, you haven't seen anything until you've seen vision, the amount of people, the amount of classes, the the content, the whole thing. And, uh, you know, a couple people have like, well, I can help you get there. I, I know you can help me get there, but like, it's, it's sometimes how the scheduling falls, you know, in, in, in how busy the shops are certain shops geographically, you get into really busy time when some of these events are going on. Right. And then it's yeah, like, we still got to work. 
yeah, you sp- can you spare the guys to go? But I, you know, I think about so much. The mentorship thing for me has been has been key because, you know, I had some good people help me, but once I kind of got to that level of, I'm in a dealership and I'm flat rate. There was no mentorship, you know. Yeah, it's and, it's hard. And unfortunately, I had to move away from a shop that was probably going to mentor me pretty good because financially I couldn't afford to stay there. Yeah. Like I was, I couldn't, I could not at $11 an hour in 2001, I was, I couldn't do it. You know, the financially it, it made no sense. It was costing me more to go to work most weeks than I was making, but what you're buying tools and, and the cost and all that kind of jazz go to the dealer, make, you know, $6 more an hour flat rate. And could start in the dealer and easily quickly turn forty a week, you know, you're automatically that's a huge pay bump. Huge. Right? Yeah. I, I did the same thing. Yeah. You don't necessarily get the the mentorship, but we had a good we had a good team where people helped one another. You know, so you're you're mentoring that way too. I wish, you know, I, I'd been able to get into a shop and stay there where somebody was like really sharp and walked me through, you know, the process to, to be developing the tech that I am now, because there's some bad habits I have. Some days my attitude is like, you know, <laughs> don't overthink it, you know, keep it. I still, I still diag like I'm flat rate. You know, I still at, oh, 30, I, me too. at 36 minutes, I'm thinking like, shit, I should have already had this thing figured out. Cause it used to be, I got 30.6 was what you were expected to get to diagnose most electrical stuff. And that was it. 36 minutes, you know? And then if it was like, that was your initial code scan, you know, if it was an EVAP fault, you could go back and sell some testing on top of that. But I mean, most of the time, if it was like a no start or a no run or an in, you know, an in limp transmission, 36 minutes, that's what you got. That was your initial kind of, and you kind of had to know your product really good and your pattern failures and be able to say to the advisor, well, we can do this. We can sell a whole lot more labor to to go in and do some testing or we had one of these last month and it this is what it needed and do they want to try that and yeah because yeah, that's that's hard and then i see shops like i think it's seth thorson that has boxes for all of his techs and stuff it's like dude that's the that's the pinnacle right there like if you've got boxes for your guys and everybody's hourly and everybody's helping each other and you know what they're only turning 40 hours who freaking cares? Yeah. Like, it, it drives me nuts. Like, our guys will, we're, we're turning 120 to 125% efficient. And it's like, we need more. Like, ah, I think we're good. Like, let's keep it here. We, we can't train anybody because these guys are hanging and banging and, yeah. you know, hourly shop. And you can take care of your guys so much better. You might not make as much money, but I think you have, longer lasting techs guys that seem to care more uh, mm-hmm. that care about the team i don't know that's just my personal thing can, so, can i ask you where you think the pressure is coming from in your shop to to see more production just goals yes. growth goals of what we set when i started a couple years ago it was like a million dollars and Every year it was, we're over $3 million. Mm-hmm. So it's, we just move the number out and keep moving the number out. So the guys I like now, now that I'm manager, I do things a little bit differently. I start at the bottom up. I care about my guys first. Like I already told the owner, sorry, but the, the techs and the service advisors come first. Mm-hmm. I'm getting them paid. In turn, they are going to take care of the customer, and the customer in turn will take care of you. But I'm working from the bottom up. Right. So within two weeks, at my porter, I'm sending him to Vegas. He used to live out in Vegas. So I'm sending him to Vegas for a week, all paid. So I'm taking care of my guys. That dude is bought in. He loves it here. All my guys, you know, they got a little extra, a little bump. You know, I'm trying to raise up to where they make a little bit more money. I got... One tech who never made six figures made six figures this year. I promised him that I would get him there. So uh, we got a couple that made six. So yeah. 
you know, I'm taking care of these guys and making sure they're, they're taken care of. And it is, it's, it must be trending then Jeremy to the actually getting that you're still going to hit the goals that, that management has put down or ownership has put down on you then. Right. Yeah. I've been doing it long enough. It was just little tweaks I needed to do to bring it back up. We were down almost a million dollars from when I left to when I came back. So unfortunately my first month back was our first month ever losing money Mm -hmm. because I had to, I had to let two people go. I had one tech that did 36 hours of comebacks for another tech that I let go. So I, it was, it was brutal. It's like, Sometimes you got to make the hard decisions, and I, I paid for it. I, I lost my butt the first month. I had 36 so, hours of rework, though. Awful. Uh, yeah. I was, you know, when you lose 10 grand in rework, that's also 10 grand that that tech couldn't make for you. So you lose 20 grand right there in a chunk. Just going to say like, that. Yeah. Oh, uh, most people don't take that into I was just, And then I was just going to say, you know, they, they always think, well, rework sucks. Because I had to, you know, it cost whatever I had to pay. I had to pay a higher paid guy or I had to pay whatever, or I had to give the customer money back. I think a lot of the time it doesn't pop up enough in the conversations when they're reworking, not even their own comebacks, but say somebody else's comebacks, they're not making any new money, right? Like that drove me crazy because when I was way back, like the, the podcast that dropped a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about my backstory. I did nothing but like other people's comebacks because I was the hourly street time guy. And oh, yeah. it drove me up. It, it drove me to where I, I walked myself right out of that job because they couldn't see it. Right. Like it's okay. Yeah. You know, so if, if all it takes is for the car to get fixed properly is to me either to be on it or whoever could be on it, but they just have to give them more time to fix the car, then either give them more time to fix the car or give me all the cars. It's as simple as that, right? That's that's your two options. And it wasn't like I was any better than anyone else. I was young and new and and not that, but it was just, I didn't have the over my head of like, I've only had 36 minutes to diagnose this, right? I was hourly. I was like in a dealership hourly, whatever. Cool. Great. Get in there. And it's like, it didn't matter if it took me an hour and a half to, to go back and fix the car. You'd see it. And it's like, that tech spent no time on it because they, they, they either weren't going to pay him or if it was going to be under warranty and he didn't know what he was going to do and he wasn't going to go down that back road, he was going to be like, I'll get rid of this car. I'll get a job that I can get done because there was always a brake job waiting. There was always a tire job waiting and, and I'll slap that out. I looked at it and it's like, why do we keep going in circles dispatching work to people that don't want to do that work? Yeah, because it was it's always the same thing. The C tech that you're you know paying twenty dollars an hour to screws it up, mm-hmm. screws up a hundred dollar part. So now you're hopefully warranty in that part. And then what do you do? You give it to your A tech because it's got to get done right this time. So you're losing a hundred dollars on a part. You're paying your A tech tax and benefit loaded fifty dollars to mm-hmm. to do it. So you're out one hundred fifty bucks. But that A tech could have made you 200. So you just lost $350 for every hour that you're doing a comeback. So why not hire an A tech to begin with? And instead of the C tech turning 30 hours, the A tech turn you 40 or 50 and you don't have the reworks. It's like, Oh my God, like you guys are losing. Some of these shops are losing 10, $20,000 a month because they're saving, you know, $600 on the tech. Like, but see, that's the that's the figure that always drove me nuts because I I'll, I'll say this: there's so many shops that don't even track that. Yeah, do nobody not, nobody cares they, about it. They don't even track really to the accuracy that it should be of of rework or un unbuild and unapplied. And we you know we see all these guys and they get up there and they flex their muscles and puff their chest out about how great their shops are, but they're not talking about the unapplied level. That's in their in their bill or the unbilled hours that were in that building. Like they, well, we hit this for the month. Cool. But me as that guy that was that guy. What was your what was your unapplied like? What was your unbilled? Right. That's the true story. <laughs> and then you see, it's such a manipulated yeah. number too because it's like, oh well, you know, 
it was an air box that wasn't put on all the way and the check engine light came on. So I brought it back in. We scanned it. You know, we, we put Mrs. Jones air box back on and I went and had a talk with the tech and it went at the door. Half hour gone, right? Half an hour is gone. We didn't even bother. There's, there's no part. There's no work order. There's no record. Nothing. It's not. It's by the end of say that happens on Monday by Friday. It's forgotten about. We had a really good week. Forgotten about. Well, that unapplied then is doesn't even show up at the end of the month. Yeah, and that's a hundred dollars lost. Mrs. Smith remembers it. Oh yeah. Well, we took care of her, right? We got we we took care of it. We smoothed it over. It's all good. Blah blah blah. But nobody looks at it and goes, "That tech that went and fixed that, that's not showing on their production sheet. It's not showing on any any metric anywhere." Yep, and that's because- typically a shop foreman who's getting screwed royally. And like, well, he's not producing no hours. He's only turning 40 hours. Yeah, he was your 60, 70, 80 hour guy. Now he's only turning 40 because you're not tracking that crap. Like if you just tracked all of the comebacks and the warranties and you wrote that number down and every month, like the owner had to take that money out of his pocket and set it off to the side and then count that up and go, man, I could have bought an ATEC with that. Mm -hmm. You realize real quick, "Ah, maybe we should have a shop full of ATECs instead of trying to hire cousin Willie to come in here because he's got a pulse and not train him and just give him a, you know, craftsman set of tools and say, here you go. Fix this hundred thousand dollar suburban. See you. Call me when it's done. So you saw that big conversation that we had about a month ago with, with, you know, the woman that started on TikTok and trickled into Facebook. Oh, the, my, my friend who's a, a race car mechanic, like come the hell on. So what like, do you don't understand how business works? Right. I was going to ask you, so like, because I had a lot of people and it's still a Super Mario made a post and somebody else kind of, it's the same topic coming up again. What, what is, 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 is a hundred percent markup on a part ripping people off? No, it depends on where you want to be a hundred percent markup on a 50 cent nut. Mm-hmm. That ain't much, is it? But if you say, a hundred percent markup on a seven thousand dollar engine. Yes. Yeah, that to me is probably a little high. Different thing. We have a sliding scale. It starts out big and gets down smaller. Like typically, if I'm selling a five thousand dollar engine, uh, I'm probably only eight hundred dollar markup. Yeah. So I'll probably have a higher markup on a thousand dollar part than I will a five thousand dollar. But I, uh, I'm gross profit per hour. That's the number I need to look at. How much money are we going to make? this hour after my tech gets paid. So if I'm making $150 an hour, I don't care about GP percentage. I don't care about any of that stuff because that's not money in my pocket. Mm -hmm. So I know how much money I make an hour. And if I sell 40 hours at that, I know how much money I make. It's an easy math, easy way to do it. So that lady was losing her mind over like a $130 range sensor for a Toyota that I think she got billed out to her at like 300 bucks. Right. And everybody's like, Oh my God, a hundred dollar markup is, is ripping the people off. And I I see all these people talking in the different lines and the different online forums and whatnot. And they're all like, well, I've, I've built my business on a 30% markup. You know, I'm, I'm booked out. I got all these referrals. I'm successful and all that kind of stuff. And it's like all these people that are, are first of all, their names that I don't recognize. And their names are a lot of the other ones we don't recognize. And you say to them, well, shit. So maybe the guy that's got his margin at 100% for that part, maybe that's why he's at Vision next year. Maybe that's why he's at AHP. Maybe that's why he's at Apex. You're sitting over there and, you, and you've done your business for 20 years that way. And that's great. You know, and, and you, you're, you're booked solid. You've earned yourself a good living. You know, you take some money home at the end of the year. You're Cool. Are you, are you doing anything more? Is there any growth going on there? And I think that's where the difference, what was lost on so many people in that whole conversation was the margin is what I think gives you the growth, right? It's, it's being able to train your technicians, to train your service uh, advisor. These people, I think they want to, when they say, I want to keep my margin here, they're running a smaller operation and they're not thinking bigger. They're not thinking growth. They're just thinking sustainability. There's nothing wrong with a shop that does that. But the way that everybody just climbed onto that conversation to say that that shop is ripping her off 
I just about lost my mind. Like I, <laughs> oh yeah, that I, I had to actually stop watching mm-hmm. that and go back to it because I was just getting like super pissed off because you know they said it's 130 bucks. Did she call the freaking junkyard? Did she call AutoZone? Did he sell her three hundred dollar Toyota part for three fifty? Or you know you don't know where the margin set. And yeah, you brought your own part. Well, yeah, we still have to make that markup. I was thinking, hell, it should have been 50% more, not just like, I think it was only like, I did the math, it was like 26%. Like, hell no, it would have been a lot more than that. Like, you want to bring your own part? It's 800 bucks. Screw you, I don't want to do it. Take it out of here. Get it out of here. That's like, And that's what was so lost on so many people, and they don't even get it, is it's like, we're, we're sitting here saying he was wrong to to – you know, all of a sudden then adjust the quote because she was supplying the part. Everybody lost their mind about that. And I'm sitting here in the background going, he shouldn't even have booked the car in. Shouldn't even have booked the car in, right? If she wants to, all of a sudden, she's been this way with him forever. And all of a sudden now, because some race car mechanic says, hey, you're getting ripped off. Stop that. He shouldn't have said, okay, Mrs. Smith, with all due respect, our business relationship ends here. I wish you all the best in the future. You know, and, and the shop might not have presented any of the value. You know, did they give her a loaner car to drive that she didn't have to pay for? Did they, you know, were they putting a three year warranty on a one year dealership part? Like, there's a lot of that story that wasn't told because we only got one side. And but, we, kept, we kept bringing up those issues, just like you said, examples yeah. of why the margin is there. And nobody had a rhetorical answer for any of it. You know, yeah. they couldn't say like well, when when we kept going back to warranty, nobody, everybody was crickets, was mute. People were mummed about it. They did, had nothing to say, uh, you know, nothing to say about, well, so what you're doing is you're, you're, you're running your margin really low and you're giving people pretty much like a taillight warranty on that's it. Or you're saying, oh, your Dorman part failed. Let me call the parts store and see if they'll stand behind this one. Whereas if I put my margin up, to you know whatever it doesn't matter if i put a dormant part on them even because maybe that's the only part i can get and this is not me shade of dormant please if dormant's listening but say in his oh, example I use an aftermarket I story. <laughs> well, well we'll hear it and all of a sudden now that's just the difference right is that the fact that i put my margin up more than them but that part fails i can take care of them isn't that what everybody wants in this industry is to be taken care of like yes. look after seem like we're genuinely invested in the reliability and the safety of the vehicle. I, we hear customers say that all the time. That's what I genuinely want. Okay. Well, that costs money. So give me your Dorman story. Cause I, we, we should have well, one every week now. It's actually a good thing. Yeah. We, we did one of the oil coolers for the sure. Chrysler's, uh, you know, all metal, put it in there. No oil pressure. Like, oh, crap. What are we doing? But the engine didn't make any noise. So we found out that they just didn't drill all the way through for the oil pressure sender okay. on there. So I sent a message to Dorman, and it was like 20 minutes. They messaged me back. Like, hey, what was the part number? What was the box number? We're pulling production. We're going to yank all these off the shelves. We're going to rip everything out. Like, they, I've never seen a company care as much as they did. I had three people get a hold of me from Dorman. Like they wanted to know yeah. what was wrong. I mean, we can, we can bash on Dorman because let's admit their, their window regulators suck. They, they suck. I mean, I got, I do a bunch of them in my car. Uh, I, I hope they're getting better at it. But as far as a company that like, I've never seen anybody go this hardcore like they were willing to pull all of these off the shelf just to fix this problem. Like I, I was impressed. I, I will say I was impressed. They're going through with training uh, that whoever they got in charge or has been in charge here lately seems like they're slowly turning this thing. Oh, now reputations last decades. Yes. So I'm hoping that they fix some of these things and they can knock it out. All it was was just like a little piece of casting. All, all we had to do was just knock it. Boom, it was perfect. But they didn't want any of them on the shelf. So I, I'll give Dorman props, man. I was I was impressed. 
I've so. I've put a fair bit of their parts in since I started at this new shop in September. Because I'll tell you right away, at the previous shop I had a little bit more input on what parts we put on. <laughs> so I would say, you know, we have a dealer option or we have a doorman. And my my previous boss just went, okay, we'll get it from the dealer because he didn't want to run the deal. My current boss now, because he's very much into the UAP Napa program and, and being able to warranty, if he can warranty a dormant part sold, you know, Napa solutions, it's going in. And I can honestly say we put them in and we haven't had like every one that we put in comes back. You know what I mean? Since I've been there. So, I mean, we put a timing sole note in that made me a little nervous and, and I'm like, well, we put it in and it's, and it's been fine. You know, the car hasn't come back. So ha, props to Dorman because when I went to ASTE, uh, they seemed to be, I can't remember, Lester, and there was another gentleman from Dorman. Yeah, Lester was, actually got a hold of me. So, yeah. and, I mean, like immediately. And they're, they seem to be very much about, like, and they don't, like, I'm sure it must be tough because people must joke with oh, them. Oh, yeah. They've heard every joke that there is. But they, 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 They've got thick skin, and they go, yes, we earned our reputation, unfortunately. Now we're trying to turn the corner. And, I, uh, you know, if, if they can do it, man, they'll, they'll have a lock because they, they do so much more for the industry in parts and crap that you know there isn't a lot of margin on some of the stuff they make. So for anybody to go like, all right, I'm going to make the part that nobody makes instead mm-hmm. of like let's just make all the widgets that everybody needs – I, I'm impressed with Dorman. I, I tell you, man, that was, and, and talking to them and, and some of the trade shows, like they care. Mm-hmm. And it's not the Dorman that I got pictured in my head. Like, well, if it moves or electricity runs through it, we don't buy it from AutoZone or Dorman. Like, I, you know, I, sometimes that's the only part. Like I got old Buicks and nobody makes a regulator. It's only Dorman. Yeah. I get a year and a half because all our windows freeze up six months out of the year. And yeah, we're, they're probably taxed and yeah, it's, it'd be hard to make that part, and, but I can't and, get a dealer one. Well, and it, like when I worked at Chrysler, the, the factory OE caravan window regulator would fail all the time. Constantly. <laughs> the door was always broken. Yep. And it was why it wasn't the part was defective. It's the same thing though. It freezes in the window track. Customer pulls up to their drive through first thing in the morning. I need my hot cup of coffee from Tim Hortons and I need a damn bed. And I hit that button and it wasn't rolled down. Instead of it opening the door, what does everybody do? They get right angry and they just start hammering on that button to roll that window down. You know what? It's, something's going to break, right? And yep. people say, well, it must be the dormer part. Let's think about that for a minute. That one on the passenger side probably lasts three times as long as the one in the driver's side. They're identical parts, right? Let's think about that duty cycle on that on that driver's side one that we put in the dormer. So what stops this from happening? Well, we should be maybe treating the weather seals a little bit better, you know, doing, so spray. doing the job a little more thoroughly than just jamming the regulator. Does anyone do it? No. Nope. And then just, you know, chuck it in there and it fails and they blame the, blame the part. You know, it's, it is what it is. It's too bad. I, um, that oil cooler that they came up with for the Pentastar, that three six is, is a, I saw it at, at AST last year and, I drive one of those Jeeps and I keep dreading when the day comes that mine starts to leak. And, but I'll, I'll still run out. That'll be the first thing I'll buy. I'll go and get that because they're, they're good about improving a part. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, they, they'll look at, they genuinely want to look at something, look at the weak point and try and make it better. And that can be tough, right? Because sometimes oh, yeah. you can't make the part any better. It's just, it is what it is, but. We stock we stock the factory one here, and I think they're already on like AF or AG. How many times they've changed it? So, and now they don't come with any of the sensors. They don't come with anything. So, and the, the, what causes them to leak is people get like big monkey gorilla hands and, and just over torque that like it's a lug nut putting that filter yep. cap. And I mean, and that's really because like mine's not leaking, and I got a ton of kilometers on my Jeep, and it never has leaked now. I went back to the service history. It's never been changed. So it's a 2015. It's eight years old. It hasn't been changed. Why? Because I don't reef that thing on there like it's, you know, a crank bolt. Like I put it on there like it's a oil filter cap. And, and that could be why the thing is staying together. I don't know. But hats off to Dorman for just figuring out. It's like, well, if we make this out of aluminum, they can't. 
three as much, you know. So it's yeah, they, they've they've stepped it up. So hopefully it keeps going that way because they make a couple of the bolts and stuff that we can't get because we do a lot of the the GM piston recalls on the two fours. Yeah, so okay. Dealer Tech man, he can he can do one of them in like four and a half hours, like rebuild that thing. Like he's just. It's insane how fast he does them. And certain parts of that you can't get. Dorman makes the bolt and like, heck yeah, they saved our butts. Yeah. So I've put a few of their timing components in with always a little, but I haven't had a failure. So I, I can't, you know, I, I want to still be with that whole 20 years of, oh, Dorman crap. But I'm telling you, mm-hmm. it's not the same stuff. Yeah, not cheap plastic. Cheap plastic. I don't care where you get it from. You know. So but, what's what's the long term goal for you? I'm actually enjoying being the manager. Mm-hmm. I I want to see. It's not really for me. My house is paid off. I don't owe nobody nothing. I'm eventually going to move to Florida. I my knees hurt. I'm in pain every day. It hurts to walk. I beat myself up way too much younger. So eventually, I want to go where it's warm. So I'm, I'm going to move to Florida, see my mouse every weekend. And, you know, <laughs> that's my goal. Maybe maybe move down to Florida and uh, manage a shop down there. I'll be that old crotchety uh, shop manager or owner down there. It's just, here we go. But so you, my goal is to see these guys make killer money. You'd go back to owning again? If it came up. I actually I own another shop. Just – not not right time, not in the cards. I ended up taking in two little babies. So I started all over with kids. So one of them's kind of a special needs. So it takes a lot more of my, yeah. my attention and a lot more work. So my babies are now my life. So being the manager here gives me a little bit more freedom. I don't go home aching my brain hurts more but my fingers and knees don't hurt as much so yeah, you can get down and play <laughs> a little bit so i i really respect that you say like you know when you're just saying a second ago the goal for you is right now is to see your people make really good money i mean i, yeah. I think that, you know that's something that a lot of people say but i don't think that you know there it's always necessarily as genuine as i know you know with you with what it is and it's 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 the same reason i do this right i just want to see it all get better I mean, I, I want to see I want to see owners do better, you know. But I I want to I want to see right now. The goal for me is to make technicians understand their value, realize where you are right now in this industry. You have never been at a, this point in the history of this industry. You have never been at this point before where you're that valuable to what they need. Yeah. To done. So make it. This lucrative. is the time. This is the time. You know, like make yourself turn. Yeah, make yourself indispensable, invest in yourself, but by God, value yourself, man, because there's such a shortage now. Don't be one of these guys that just hangs it up and gets out of the industry. You know, fight that fight where it's like you find the people like yourself that will look after you, will treat you properly, and go work for them. Find that passion back. Like, I have I have passion, you know, for, for fixing cars that's never gone away, but I have passion again for, like, listening to the customer's complaints and, you know, genuinely giving a crap because it's like, if my boss treats me really well, pays me really well, like he does, then I genuinely am concerned. You know, I I want to, I want to see their, their experience be everything it can be when I'm paid poorly and I'm treated poorly. We can't expect then that like most of us are going to give a crap. That's then falls on the responsibility owner to give a crap. Because if you're not paying me enough to be invested, I'm not going to invest, you know, and it's, it's really that simple. And we're starting to learn our value and it's, it's, I see a lot of growing pains that are going on, but I think it's awesome that, you know, there's owners out there like yourself that, that genuinely want to see the techs make, you know, six figures. Like the fact that you promised your tech that he's going to do it and you saw it happen, you made that, put the processes in place for him to do it. That's huge, man. It's really good. Yeah, that that was a uh, that one was really cool for me. He's he's about my age. He's so uh, he come up to me and said I was probably the best manager he's ever had, and you know that that like mm-hmm. that 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 kind of I felt good. Yeah, I did. 
Do you, do you think so, that you have to be what makes a really good manager in this industry, though, is somebody that's actually turned the wrench? No. no. Nope. I don't think so. I think some of the worst service advisors are people that's turned a wrench. Wow. But then again, I think some of the best service advisors are guys that's turned a wrench. So yeah. it really depends on who it is. Mm -hmm. So me as a service writer, not my strong suit. As a manager, that's kind of, I don't know, it almost comes easy, I guess. So uh, show compassion, care about it. And if you care about the people, that'll make you a better manager than, you know, that numbers, numbers, numbers. Yeah. I don't know if anybody listens to the Flat, uh, flat Rate Tech podcast, but that that guy, he, he says things that just, it hits home for a lot of people. Yeah. And, and you understand like sometimes you get some serious laughs out of, out of some I, of this stuff. I've heard a couple of his episodes, and Lucas and I talk about it behind the scenes, and he goes, I'm like, I didn't know you could curse that much in, the, in, a, in a podcast. As that guy sometimes like, it is, it is. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a church kid. Like, I'm not offended by, by cursing. Like, it doesn't. But I listen to it, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, man, I hope Joe Pruitt never hears this. <laughs> Right. Whereas mine, what I put out there, I, I, if the public hears mine and they're not in the industry and they hear it, I don't stress over it. It's cool. Yeah. Right? Like it, it's, it's probably not going to resonate with you, but if you hear it, you're not going to, I feel like you're not going to judge me. I listen to him and I'm like, thank God his isn't the only one that's out there representing our industry. Cause if it did, man, they might still think we're a bunch of, you know, <laughs> Un, untrained, unskilled, very angry, very uneducated, you know, knuckle draggers. And yeah, that's, not, I, I, don't, I don't mean any disrespect to them. Sometimes when we get a little passionate and worked up, you know, we, we, but whew, there's, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of this in, in his stuff. And I'm just like, that's not mine. That's not my podcast. Oh yeah. It's, but yeah, it, it it's the way a lot of technicians feel though. Like you could, you could hear and feel the passion when he talks about that sometimes, uh, how jaded he was and how hard he probably had it there for a while. And he's just saying what a lot of us are scared to say and don't want to say out loud. Yeah. Uh, Michael, I've never worked in a dealership. I've been, I don't know. I consider it lucky, but I, to me, the dealership was the pinnacle when, when I was growing up. Like the, if you were the A tech at the dealership, that's, that's where all the money was made. That's where all the tools were. That's where everything was. And I think it's actually changed yeah, in the has. last 20, 25 years. It, I think it, it's opposite now. 100% has. And, and, you know, I don't ever, I advocate for dealer techs. I stand up for them. Uh, there's another story I'll probably talk about on TikTok or something about why it's been really hard the last couple of days to stand up for them. It's a, it's a separate story and I'll share it there, but <laughs> because I say it all the time, if it hadn't have been for a dealer, I wouldn't have made it. I wouldn't have made it. I wouldn't have got the yeah. training. I wouldn't have got the pay that I needed to make it to this point in, in the, in the industry. Now, you know, I, I was like a, you know, I was like a, a husband that kept over, you know, forgiving indiscretions from the way the dealerships treated me. I'd keep going back. But, you know, you go back because you need a job. You go back to a dealership because if you can work the process somewhat, you can make money at it. But the yeah. last kick for me was like, there's no way. I'll sell the tools and I'll go drive truck and then I'll ever go back to a dealership because I know I finally know my worth. I finally worked with enough guys that that can't keep up with what I can do, not in the production, but in the problem solving, that I'm never going to devalue myself or let my production number dictate my true skill set or value. It's never going to happen again. So if I can't work for somebody that can't value me, I ain't, I'm just not going to work. And, and this is the, the, what I want to get through to people that are listening. If you know you're vital, go get everything you're entitled to get because you have such a short window to do it. And, you know, I hope I would love to see the dealers get some good training 
and start to really look after the people and treat them well because like they deserve it. They 100% deserve it. The way the kind of crap they're turning out now in the factories and what you're expected to be able to solve. Uh, I say this a lot of independent shops. You have no idea the stupidity sometimes that you see on a brand new car come off the assembly line. You have no idea because by the time maybe you see it in your shop, it's three years old, it's out of warranty. You know, a lot of the weirdness has been fixed. So the guys that are in the dealer that have to tackle that stuff every day, I'll never, ever not respect what it takes to go in and face that every day. It sucks. It really does. Yeah. So I almost went back to the dealer not too long ago. Like the uh, Ford dealer down here, like I, I really liked them. I liked everything they, they do. Uh, I wanted to, I want to build trannies. I always thought that would be a fun job. So uh, they made me an offer and I, I almost took it. Like it was, it was tough to, to, to not go. I'm yeah. telling you, cause it, it would have been a substantial pay raise, uh, but I'm not in it for the money. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, I just, I like I, fixing things. So I, I think we're very lucky to have you where you are. Honestly, I really do. So, and I, I want to thank you for coming on here tonight because you know, this was, this was one I was looking forward to doing and uh, you know, You've been nothing but supportive with me, and uh, you know I don't want to say we got off on the wrong foot, but I think it's it's much better. You, we understand each other much better when we actually just sit and have this conversation. And uh, you're, you, I'll definitely I say it all the time. I want most of the guests to be return guests, but you and I, I think we've got we're just scratching the surface here of what you have to offer and your insight. And it's a it's a very easy, you know. There's there's so many more things we can touch on. So many more things. And uh, so if you'll, ha if you'll come back again, Jeremy, I'd definitely love to have you on for sure. Hey, if you could do me a favor real quick and like, comment on and share this episode, I'd really appreciate it. And please, most importantly, set the podcast to automatically download every Tuesday morning. As always, I'd like to thank our amazing guests for their perspectives and expertise. And I hope that you'll please join us again next week on this journey of change. Thank you to my partners in the ASA group and to the Change in the Industry podcast. Remember what I always say, in this industry, you get what you pay for. Here's hoping everyone finds their missing 10 millimeter, and we'll see you all again next time.